Hey, Wid fam. This is Leo with One Happy Widow. And this channel was created to help widows and widowers to find joy, happiness, to pivot from grief to growth, and just figure out how to live life um, after the loss of their spouse. So if this is your first time joining us, if you just found us here on YouTube, then thank you so much. And I've got lots of resources down below in the um, description. So just feel free to take a look. You can also check out my website. I'm finally getting my website back up after migrating it over to a new uh, server. So you can check that out at onehappywidow.com. Also feel free to check out the other videos on this channel, see if there's anything that might resonate with you and see if there's anything helpful that you might see. Um, if this channel is helpful to you at all, make sure that you subscribe, give it a thumbs up and hit that bell so that you don't miss any future videos. So let's go ahead and get started today. So. I've been trying to brainstorm and try to come up with a, a topic to talk about today. And, and so I usually just try to think about how my grief has been affecting my life. And, you know, it's always, it always affects us. It's intertwined in everything that we do. It's that special salt, you know, that's sprinkled over everything that happens in our life. And, um, you know, it's really affected me a lot this summer. And so, but I wanted to try to think of a topic of, you know, how I could specifically talk about this in the video. And so, um, I had, I've had some moments this summer. I've had, uh, like I had a little crash and burn an emotional crash and burn. And so, um, so today's topic, I'm just going to talk about how sometimes grief is going to overwhelm us and just how we cannot allow it to take over and win. Like it's okay for grief to take over for a little bit because it's going to sometimes. Um, how to recognize it when it starts taking over, when it starts creeping in, when it starts taking too much of our attention and too much of our time and too much of our emotional energy away from us. How to recognize that, how to, um, you know, maybe give into that a little bit, you know, allow ourselves a chance to breathe and reset and then trying to get out of that rut, out of that grief rut so that we can put one foot in front of the other and start taking steps to climb out of that hole that we've been dragged back into again. So, um, I don't claim to be, have all the answers. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a counselor. I am just a widow that has been through some stuff just like you have probably if you found this channel. And, um, I just share my experiences and things that have happened to me and some things that may have helped me and some resources that I've created or resources that I've found that I can point you in the right direction in hopes that something out there will help you in this journey because I know if you're going through this journey like I am how tough it can be. So I'll give you a little recap. Uh, if you've been following me for a while you probably haven't seen any videos lately. Um, you know I'm a school teacher and so summer vacation came and I was like yes I'm gonna do a video every week and because um, I'll have all this free time and that is not what has happened and so I've actually started another channel more on the creative outlet side because sometimes you know talking about grief every single time you make a video can get a little heavy and so sometimes it's nice to have like a more lighthearted um, outlet just to kind of change the pace and you know change things up a little bit and have some fun if you want to check out that other channel it's called serial crafting it's also on youtube and right now it's just a you know following along with me overhauling this basement it's so school let out. Um, and you know, for the first several days, it was like, hallelujah. I was walking on, I was walking on sunshine. Like it was just, it was a horrible school year for me. It was very tough emotionally. It was just, uh, it was just a really hard job. And so all I could do was just think about summer, 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 and summer finally got here and it was awesome. I slept in a few days and, you know, recharged my batteries and it's just, it was great. And within a few days, I was already starting to stress about the school year coming up. And so I've been kind of fighting that battle of, you know, trying to enjoy my time off and not stress about the school year coming up. That's going to start. School is starting in 19 days. So yeah, I don't want to think about that. You know, I, I went in full force with the basement trying to uh, overhaul it because that's my summer project is to get this basement all finished. And, um, so it was going really good. I was making lots of videos. I was chugging along. It was awesome. As an ADHD person, um, yeah, everything kind of comes to a grinding halt sometimes, and 
I have these wild ideas in my head and then life gets in the way and I get overwhelmed because I take on too much. And then, you know, and then sometimes I got to just put the brakes on and take a little rest and, you know, recharge and then go back in. My sister and I decided to take a trip. You know, it's just, it's kind of weird to go on a vacation by yourself without your husband and, you know, that kind of thing. And Vacations so, when you go somewhere and you don't ever come back. So anyway, we decided to go ahead and just do it this summer. So it was a three-day trip, two nights. It was just enough time. We went to Gatlinburg, and then some things happened. And um, things just always seem to happen. Well, if you're only the grown-ups in the room, we call it the daily bullshit. But <laughs> when we're around family-friendly um, <laughs> environment, then we just call it the daily bullsh. It always seems to follow us for some reason. So we're getting ready, we're planning for our trip, and, you know, we always joke that it's never like a holiday or a family get-together without some bullsh following us along. So um, the night before we decided to leave, um, I get a call, a frantic call from my 21-year-old daughter, and I was in the basement with my sister when she was trying to call, and I don't get a signal down here, so she's calling and calling and calling, and I'm not getting the, I'm not hearing it. I'm not hearing the phone ring. I'm not getting the calls. And, um, so then she calls my husband who's upstairs and she's calling him and she's like, please tell mom to call me. Please tell mom right now. If she's got to call me right now. And she's like hysterical. And I mean, I was only down here for 20 minutes and all hell seems to break loose. And so, uh, my husband finally comes down and he's like, Hey, Braylon's trying to contact you. Something bad is going on. You need to go upstairs and take this call. Um, she needs you right now. Her best friend from high school, her name was Emma, had been killed in a car accident. So she she was actually one of my students, and I taught her before Braylon even met her. She was one of my kiddos at um, the high school that I worked at, and she, I taught her in a math class. And, you know, it's been seven years, so it's kind of hard to remember all the details, but I think I might have had her for two math classes. Um, I remember her being real moody and, you know, just like a little broody and, but somehow I managed to get through to her just by kind of with my sense of humor and just kind of joking around. And I ended up getting really close to her and she said I, she would call me her school mom. And Braylon and Emma were like this. And I will tell you, Braylon has had a ton of friends. Braylon is very social. Um, she's like a social butterfly. I can't even keep up with all of her friends. I don't even try to, but Emma was that was her person, you know, like if you've seen, um, Grey's Anatomy, like Meredith and Christina, like Emma was just her person. She was just always seemed to be there. She was the kid that you come home and you're like, Oh, Emma's here. Like they don't even ask if she can spend the night. She just comes over, but she was driving home and, um, from a friend's house and she lost control of her vehicle. It was a one car accident. And she, when they found her, she was already, um, passed away at the scene. Her parents decided to donate her organs and, um, they also decided to cremate her. Braylon's really upset about that um, because she felt like she needed that closure. And that's something I never really talked about. So if you've had a, um, if, if you've had a loss and your, <clears throat> your spouse was cremated, um, do you think that is a different way of um, starting that grief process? You know, if you, if, if the death was unexpected, and so the last time you saw that person, you didn't realize it was the last time you, that you were going to see them. <clears throat> you know, Braylon even told me, she said I was really uh, disappointed because I wanted to have that last time seeing her. I wanted to see her and know that it was the last time I was going to see her so I could say goodbye to her and, you know, have that closure. And also, she said it just doesn't even feel real because the last time I saw her, you know, we were hanging out. And she was at the house and she was hugging everybody and telling us she loved us. And it's been a few months, you know, because they're not in high school anymore. So they don't see each other all the time. But, you know, the last time that I saw her, she was just at the house. I came home. She's hanging out on the couch. She's like, hey, mom. She hangs out for a little while, you know. And then when she gets ready to leave, she gave me a hug. And, you know, I hugged her for a few seconds and I went to pull away. And while I pulled away, she just kind of grabbed me tighter and just held on a little bit longer. So I hugged her again, which I thought was kind of, you know, strange. But I thought, well, she must need a long hug, you know. And then she said, I love you, Mom. And, and then she left. You know, and that was, didn't even realize that was the last time that I was ever going to see her. And so you think about it, kind of 
like you see her then and that was like in December so it's been like six or seven months you know since I've actually seen her and so not seeing her body and um you know having that memorial and things it's just like it's a piece of news and you know what happened but you your mind is just still you know in the in fresh grief your mind cannot accept that that person is gone like it just seems like they're just away and that they're going to come back later <laughs> and so you know the first part of um going through this grief process is trying to get your heart and your brain to meet in the same place and to come to that realization that this is not a bad dream and that, that this is really happening and that this person's never really coming back and like they're really gone, not just gone out of the room, but like gone from the earth and you know, all these sad things because you're trying to convince yourself of something that's the last thing you want to be convinced of. Right. And so here we are and Braylon is, she's lost her dad. And then um, it's, it's incredible, not incredible in a good way. It's, um, it's incredible the amount of loss that this child has experienced in the short number of years since her dad has passed away. So even when she was in high school, a close friend of hers was hit by a car in the middle of the road and left to die in the street at like two o'clock in the morning. And I think she was the last person who texted him. And she wondered why he stopped texting her like all of a sudden out of the blue. And, um, another one of her friends died in a car accident a week after she graduated from high school. Another one of her friends, um, died of a drug overdose. Um, um, another one of her, not friends, but an acquaintance of hers, you know, kind of ran in the same circles, um, died of his own doing. And, um, these were all kid. this is all in high school like at least four and maybe it might've been one more. I don't remember because I don't, like I said, I don't, I did not know all of these kids personally. These were in her circle of friends, but at least four that I can think of now. And then since high school, at least two more. And so you are talking about more than one handful of people that she has known personally has died um, since she's 15, including her dad. And and it's been sad. And every time she goes through this grieving process, it just rips that scab of that, that wound open again, that grief wound open again. It's kind of like PTSD. It brings her all the way back to those moments again. But then for this, you know, for it to be her best friend in the whole world, like, she, you know, she was her person, like right there with her the whole time. And so for it to be her. And then I think about like, I think about how they used to ride together all the time everywhere, you know, and I think about what if Braylon had been in the car with her on the one hand, I think, you know, what if Braylon had been driving instead of Emma? Maybe neither one of them would have been fit to drive her. Maybe the same thing would have happened and Braylon would have been in the car with her and, and she could have been taken like that. But this happened the night before we left for our vacation, you know, hotels already booked plans already made bags already packed. She's already at my house going to spend the night. We're going to wake up at 4 a.m. to go to Gatlinburg. And so I'm thinking, should I cancel this trip? Um, but then I was like, what, I mean, what can I do? You know, like I could, I could try to be there for Braylon, but she was supposed to, she was going to try to be with the family. She's married. She's got her husband. She's got her siblings. She's running around doing all these things. She's hanging out with her friends. Her friends are having memorial services. They're doing this get togethers. They're going to the crash site. They're doing all these things. I'm not a part of any of that. This is their, this was their peer group. And so I thought, you know, I, I, I can't change the course of the events. You know, the timing is horrible. My heart is breaking, but I'm, I'm going on this trip, <laughs> you know, and I felt kind of guilty about it, but I realized that I needed it for myself. Like I didn't, I felt bad about leaving everybody behind and having all this stuff go on. But at the same time, I realized that I, I needed this for me. And I feel like I live so much of my life doing things for other people. And it's not that I'm complaining about it. It's just hard. You know, it's just takes a lot out of you. Um, I'm a wife, so my husband needs me. I'm a mom. One of my kids still lives at home is in middle school. She needs me. She plays volleyball. I got to take her everywhere. Um, you know, I still have to enforce rules and guide her and make sure she goes to church and take her phone and make sure she's not doing things she shouldn't do. She's a teenager, those types of things. You know, that's, if you have a mother of teenagers, you know what I'm talking about, right? So I needed this for me. 
So we decided that we were going to go ahead and go. But we went there for our three days and two nights, and we just forgot about everything that was at home. We forgot about, you know, the grieving people at home. We forgot about, you know, I forgot about the YouTube channel. <sighs> forgot about school. Forgot about the housework. Forgot about the basement. Just forgot about everything. And just like lived in that moment for those three days. We went to an escape room. We sang a whole lot of karaoke till our voices were about gone. You know, we had to And if I'm right, he's headed straight to hell. <laughs> some drinks we had a we stayed in a hotel that was one block from the karaoke place and so we walked everywhere and um you know we did some shopping probably too much shopping we bought some gifts and souvenirs just you know we ate in a, just a lot of different new places that we hadn't tried before and um we just had fun you know we just told jokes and laughed our butts off and um you know probably accidentally peed in our pants a couple times from laughing too hard and you know, and I, and you look back at it now and you talk about it and, and I think, how could I have just had so much fun, you know, when everything back home was just imploding and falling apart and just, you know, all that stuff. And then I realized that I needed it so much that I allowed myself to compartmentalize, I suppose, mm -hmm. and just take all of the grief and stress and struggle and just ball it up in one little container and just leave it at home. And not even open the container, not look at it, not smell it, not think about it, not glance in its direction. Because I knew it was going to keep, you know, it like it was still going to be there when I got back. It was still going to be the same problems and issues waiting on me when I got back. And so I just chose not to bring it with me. And some people I think are able to do that better than others. Some people I don't know if are able to do it at all. I don't really know about that phenomenon. I just know I'm really good at it. I don't know how common that is, but I was just able to, you know, just leave it all behind and not think about it. And then went up on our trip and, and we just had a loads of fun. And, um, then by the time it was done on that third day, it was like, it's time to get home because I'm tired. And, you know, we came home on Wednesday, the memorial services on Friday, you know, the, um, get, they get together for the, you know, for their friends or whatever was on Thursday. Um, I had a therapy appointment on Thursday and totally forgot to go. So that's how like out of it that I was, you know, my husband just doesn't, <laughs> the first time I'd been away from him for all that, you know, for that long. And I did get his blessing to go. I would not have gone if it had not been okay with him having his blessing and me actually being away for three days is a little bit different thing. <laughs> and so, you know, he was just like, I'm ready for you to be home. I don't like this, you being away. You know, it's not that he doesn't trust me. He just doesn't like the fact that I'm somewhere by myself. Something could happen. He just wants to be sure that I'm safe. And he's stressed about it and he worries. And he maybe doesn't compartmentalize as well as I do. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, so it's causing like a little bit of, eh, you know, when I come back, he's like, I'm so happy to see you, but you're never leaving again like that. That was terrible. You know, he's he just did not like the fact that I had been gone. And so... You know, and then me coming back to hitting everything so quickly, it just kind of everything hit me like a ton of bricks. After I'd had all this fun time and had not thought about any of this stuff for several days, to come back to it and hit it head on like that, everything piled up on me to the point where I crashed and burned. And this has not happened to me like this, like to this degree in a really long time. But I had, um, I skipped a dose of medicine. And, um, that turned into skipping another dose and another dose. Like, so I got to get back on that. So I'm having symptoms of Hashimoto's flaring up. Um, my ADHD medicine is not in my system. And so it's making me tired all the time. I don't have any energy on top of that. It helps me with my emotional regulation. So I'm totally dysregulated with my emotions. It helps me with my, um, sensitivity, reject, rejection sensitivity. So, Obviously, my rejection nerves are totally raw. And so whew, it was like a perfect storm of physical 
and emotional turmoil crashing together and coming off of a of a high of a vacation and coming back and facing all this stuff and so it was like the perfect storm emotionally and physically and so I basically slept in a recliner in the basement by myself for all night all day all night all day and into part of that third night I didn't brush my teeth I did not eat anything I did not drink anything I did not change my clothes I did the only thing I drank was one soda per day because I was having such bad caffeine withdrawal that my head felt like it was going to split open and so I drank one diet coke one morning just to stave off the migraine one diet coke the next morning just to wash down the Tylenol <laughs> that was it I got up to use the bathroom that was it I didn't drink any water I didn't eat any food nothing I slept I slept day and night and day and night I'd wake up a little bit my head would hurt I'd go back to sleep I'd wake up I'd go back to sleep I don't I can't believe how many hours I slept and so um and my husband was like beside himself he's like wow you've been gone for three days on vacation and then you come back and now you're gone again like what is going on I've never seen you like this what is he's mad but he's worried he's sad he's concerned he's got all these mixed emotions and I'm like just leave me alone I was not being very nice to him in texts and then my phone died because I didn't have it plugged up and so I wasn't answering anything I mean it was it was rough it was probably like one of the emotionally the lowest points um, for me like handling things in the, in a few years and so um, and like I, I didn't have thoughts of doing things I don't want to say certain words because I don't want YouTube to you know like flag the video but you know what I'm talking about when you get in a bad place and you start having thoughts I wasn't really having thoughts of that but I was having thoughts of like um, I was trying to think of things that would make me smile or you know that would bring me joy or that would snap me out of it and like I couldn't like nothing sounded good nothing sounded nothing sounded like it would motivate me to get me off of that um, chair like usually I would say well I'll just watch some YouTube like if nothing else I can watch some YouTube videos <laughs> if nothing else I can you know watch some TV or so like a TV show um, but even that was just like mm, whatever you know no crafting sounding good no video making sounded good no list making usually I'm a list maker but that happens when I take my medicine so I wasn't making any lists I wasn't making any plans I wasn't cleaning anything up I wasn't making any meals I wasn't having I wasn't listening to any music no singing any songs nothing nothing that normally brings me even small pieces of joy like I didn't even want to do it it was like I was in full-blown depression and um and it's almost like it depression I feel like it just kind of hangs over my shoulder all the time and just kind of waits for some weak moments for it to kind of take hold of me and grab me and then hold me tight. And then, you know, the longer I stand still and allow it to get its grip on me, the tighter it is and the harder it is for me to shake it off. So I think that's what happened is that depression caught up to me, situational depression caught up to me and um, I could not... Like I could not get out of its grasp. And, you know, depression is not, it's not always sadness. A lot of times it's not sadness. Like it started with sadness, but at least sadness is an emotion and you can have some motivation to get out of the sadness so you can feel better. For I, I'm just speaking for myself, but for depression, depression is like a, like the lowest form of apathy. Like it's not even sadness. It's like a nothing. It's like you don't even feel, you don't even feel, you don't even feel sad. You don't feel happy. You don't feel sad. You don't feel, you just feel like, what difference does it make? <laughs> you just, like, you just don't, I can't really explain it exactly, except for that. You would think that a person who's depressed would want to feel better. But when you're depressed, you feel so depressed that you don't even care if you feel better. You know what I mean? It's not like, and it's so hard to explain when you're not in it, because why would somebody want to just stay feeling that way and it's not really that you want to stay feeling that way it's just that it sucks away so much of your motivation that it's almost too hard to think about doing whatever you need to do to get yourself out of the depression it's like yeah I'm depressed just like when my headache was there from the caffeine I was like my head is splitting open like I had a migraine right here it was all in the front of my face 
but my my drink was upstairs and my and my Tylenol was upstairs and it was like I was still so tired and so lazy and so down and depressed and sad and I didn't want to run into anybody and I didn't want to make any noise and I just didn't want to get up that it was like I sat there for several hours with the headache just because I didn't even want to get up enough to get myself a drink and some Tylenol that would eventually make my headache go away. You know, so I would just like you rather sit there with the headache than to get up and get yourself something to make it feel better. But I mean, depression is like that, but with all of your emotions. And so that's where I was. And I was like, you know, I'm, I have these, you know, I went to these severe places. I was like, I'm just going to give up on the, I'm going to quit my job. I'm just going to break my contract and I'm not going to, I'm just not going to go back to work. I'm just going to quit. I'm going to give up my certificate and I'm just going to close the YouTube channel because uh, I haven't made in hardly any videos all summer. So everybody's probably just going to forget about me. And, you know, it's probably how can I talk about helping people get through stuff when I'm sitting in this chair, you know, haven't showered in three days or changed my clothes, even took my shoes off. You know, how how who am I to motivate anybody? Because I'm sitting here like in the puddle of mess and I, can't, I don't even want to get myself out of it. So I'll just. I'll just quit the channel and I'll just, you know, close the Facebook group and, you know, I don't worry about the basement because I don't use any of it anyway. So I'll just have Goodwill come with a big truck and I'll just load it up and let them take it away. Like I'm having all these extreme thoughts, <laughs> you know, and so that's what I did. I wallowed in self-pity and depression and angst and just shit, you know, for days. And, and I thought, I don't, and I couldn't even imagine, like, I couldn't even um, visualize how long I would do it. I was like, I'm just going to lay here and see how long it takes before starvation and, like, thirst takes so You know, like, I'm starting to do it almost an experiment on myself. I'm like, how many days can I go without eating or drinking before my body starts to shut down? This is interesting. Like, let's see if I can go another day or another night. Like, it was just, it was, it was bad. <laughs> so, um and I don't remember exactly what it was, you know, that got me. I think it was just, I was just freaking hungry. And maybe I just got bored. Maybe I slept so much that I, and my back was hurting because this recliner was not very comfortable. Um, I think it was just discomfort of laying there for so long slash boredom. And I couldn't even sleep anymore because I'd slept as much as I could sleep. And then um, I was, I think I was starting to get hungry. So I finally grabbed my phone and just looked at it and was updating you know, just checking texts and stuff. And, um, and my husband was like, look, I don't know what to do. I don't know how, you know, we had been fighting. He was, he went back and forth with like fighting with me slash feeling sorry for me slash being worried about me, wondering if he should call somebody, all these things. I was like, do not call anyone. If you call somebody down here and tattle on me, I will be so mad because I didn't want anybody to come. Like, I didn't even want anybody to come and, like, snap me out of it. I did not want somebody to take me to the hospital. I did not want somebody to come and cheer me up. I did not want anybody to even bother me. And so, and finally, he was like, look, I don't, I don't know what to do, but I love you, and I miss you, and, you know, I, I want to help you, but I don't know how. So, I will give you your space, and when you're ready, please, you know, come up. But I'm lonely, and I, I would really want you to come up here. We don't have to fight. We don't even have to talk. But if you would just come up here and sleep in your own bed tonight, then, you know, that would make me feel better. He's like, you don't even have to talk to me. And so I was like, fine. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I went upstairs and, and he had, he bought me some flowers and he bought me a card. And then he had gone to my favorite restaurant and bought my favorite meal and had brought it home and it was just sitting in the fridge waiting for me. And so I thought about, like, I felt so terrible. I felt so guilty because, you know, I had not been there for him for those past several days. I hadn't been there for the girls. And, you know, this is really bad, but like, I couldn't even bring myself to go to the memorial. So I missed it. And which means Dallas missed it. And Dallas was not, you know, Dallas was a lot younger than her, but Emma was like a big sister to, to her too. And I didn't realize how bad she wanted to go to the memorial, but I realized after when we missed it, 
<laughs> how upset she was because she didn't get to go because I didn't take her. And so, and then I felt guilty that, you know, I had given my husband so much shit for all those days. And, you know, instead of giving me the cold shoulder, I want to fight with me. He just showed grace and love and patience and just, you know, did something for me to make me feel special. And uh, not only did I feel guilty, but I felt really lucky because I knew that a lot of the people that I try to help, a lot of people on this channel, a lot of people in our group don't have that. And so um, then I thought about all the people who were in that place, that same kind of place that I had been for a couple of days, but maybe they had been there for weeks or maybe they had been there for months. And the reason why they were there was because of their grief and how they did not have anybody upstairs wait for them with flowers and their favorite meal and a card. And so I had to try to think about, like I have more resources available to me than a lot of people do. And so in a case like that, like the flowers and the meal and stuff, like that's not what got me up because I didn't even know it was there until I got up there. So I had to get myself up. You know, I had to talk myself into getting ready and getting up and going and doing the things. It's just that I was rewarded for that from somebody who cared about me. So, um, and I started thinking about all the people in our group, you know, who watch these videos who, who don't have that kind of resource. And I thought, you know, I felt selfish and I felt like, how do we replicate that? You know what I mean? How do we, how do we create something like that for people who don't have their person around all the time? And, you know, how can we, how can we make that happen? How can we help people like that? You know, I still don't have the answers, but I got some ideas. <laughs> I finally got myself out of that funk and that funk was only, you know, two and a half days. And so I started thinking that, first of all, I wanted to try to analyze what it was that got me. I already know what got me there and I talked about it, but what it was that got me out of it and then how I have come, you know, come from there and what I've done since then. And so as horrible as it was to be in that place, I think I needed it. You know, I think I needed to spend some time in the hog trough for a little while. And as horrible as it was while I was there, you know, it gave me perspective when I came out of it because it made me realize that I have people that need me and I have people that care about me and I have people and I have a job to do and I have people that depend on me and I have myself, you know, I don't, I don't deserve to be in that low place for that long, but I needed to you know, like my batteries were dead. My emotional batteries were dead and I needed to recharge them. And so I think it took, you know, just laying in the bed, laying in the recliner for two and a half days and just cleansing my whole body, cleansing my body of food. Um, I probably should have drank some water, but I'm <laughs> cleansing my body of nourishment, cleansing my body of outside, um, medicines, um, you know, um, and just allowing my mind to totally dump and clear almost like a reset, you know, so I could start over from the bottom and like crawl myself out of there and, and get back up again. And so the moral of that story is <laughs> that if you're in that place like that, you know, or if you, if you have been, or if you're heading that way, or if you're there now, then I think it's okay to be there. You know, I think it's okay for, you know, to allow yourself to just totally surrender to the emotion, totally surrender to the grief, the depression, the bad feelings, because, um, it's almost like it's waiting around for you anyway. And so, you know, just allow it to go in there and just, um, kind of clean you out, but do not stay there long because I do think that, if you stay there too long, the longer you stay, the harder it is to get out of it. And so, although I think we do need to give reverence to it, I don't know if reverence is the right word. Like, we need to recognize it and, you know, um, 
it's just like if you're running a race and like you fall down, you know, you might fall down and that's okay. But if you fall down and lay there and just let everybody else in the race trample over you, um, you know, that's not a good thing. But if you fall down, then you get yourself back up. And hopefully some of the other runners of the race near you will come and help you. And if not, then you got to figure out a way to do it yourself. And then maybe you find a new um, <laughs> a new group of runners to run with, <laughs> you know, that are a little bit more generous than the runners that were around you that just let you <laughs> struggle and get up on your own. And so, um, like I said, I don't I don't know exactly what it was like. You know, when you hit rock bottom, you sort of that's that's the time to bounce back up. That's when you have a little bit of momentum. When you hit the bottom, you got a little bit of momentum of that, you know, springboard to kind of hoist you back up in the right direction. And so that's what I would suggest for you is that you give yourself a little bit of time, feel sorry for yourself, you know, lay down there and wallow for a little bit. But um, because it helps you to appreciate when you do feel a little better. And you're like, wow, I remember when I was in that place. I don't want to go back there. And so um, just don't allow yourself to stay in that place for too long. And if you're like me, I do not like admitting that I need help emotionally, especially. I just don't like it. I don't like reaching out saying, hey, I'm having a real hard time. Can you come visit me? Can you come talk to me? And blah, blah, blah. When I'm in that place, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to be cheered up. I don't want anybody to see me like that. It's embarrassing. And it's almost like grief won, and I don't like to lose. <laughs> and so, um, you know, but if you don't have somebody there with you in your own house that is going to kind of try to encourage you to get out of that place, then, or an animal, you know, to, that you have to get up to feed or whatever, then, then you got to, you got to go reach deep down inside of yourself and find that strength. And so, um, I think the time to create those, those tools, the time to create those tools, those resources and have those things in place is not when you're on the recliner for two days and you haven't eaten or drank anything. That's not the time to say, hmm, what could I have around me that would help me get out of this funk? Like the time to get those tools ready is before you get into that funk. And so if you know if you're on this grief journey that the chances that you are going to get there is more likely than a person who hasn't lost their spouse. And so get your tools ready. Maybe have a survival kit, toolkit, something like that. A journal, like have a notebook and a pencil and have it, you know, by your bedside or whatever ready so that you can not only to take it out to write in it, but to take it out and read it. To take it out and go back and read previous posts that would say, wow. I was like this before and this is what happened and this is how I felt after and like be your own motivator, you know, use that as a motivator to try to say, okay, I remember what it was like to be in this better place and help that to motivate you to be in a better place. Um, and so have, you know, have some things next to your bed or wherever it is that you're moping, have some things that will help you snap out of it, whether it be this YouTube channel or another YouTube channel or your favorite shows or your favorite music or your favorite snacks. It's not the time to worry about being on your diet. You know what I mean? Like just whatever it is those creature comforts are that sometimes keep you going from day to day, have a like a little basket or a little bin or a little something somewhere within reach that sometimes the smallest pleasures in life are the things that you can savor the most because they're so pure and they're so simple. You know, like a Hershey's Kiss or something, you know, like a soda or a good cup of coffee. Like I went so many days without coffee, I can't even tell you. And, and if y'all have watched me for a while, you know how much I love my coffee and my coffee cup. <laughs> so like, um, so like I said, let that be your next little, um, like your next little chore, your next, your next little challenge get a notebook, get a pen, get some snacks, get a good book, get the Bible, get, you know, something handheld to keep your mind occupied that might kind of distract you, get a crossword puzzle, get a Sudoku, Sudoku, um, a Rubik's Cube, a fidget st spinner, a fidget, you know, something. Um, the remote control to the TV for your favorite show, a yoga ball, 
or a yoga mat so that you can do some stretches. Think of some mantras or whatever that you can repeat in your head if you're going to try to meditate. I don't know, your survival toolkit. I don't know what you want to call it. Give it some cutesy little name and um, put it together and have it somewhere where you can easily grab it so that when you're in that place and you're like, okay, this is ridiculous. Like, okay, I can't stay here or I don't want to stay here. I don't need to stay here. Like your brain will tell you, hey, you need to to snap out of this. But your heart is going to be like, I don't want to or I don't care. Or I know that's what I'm supposed to do, but I'm not going to. Maybe you've got that little defiance or whatever. But whatever it is that your heart is saying that's, you know, not jihan with your brain. Because your brain's going to tell you what you need to know. Your brain tells you. Your brain is like your mama, you know, telling you what what you need. You're just not listening to it at the time because you're being a brat. And so, um, whatever it is that your heart needs to you know, that toddler heart to bribe yourself out and meet yourself where your brain tells you that you need to be. That's what you need to have in your toolkit. And so, um, if you can think of some things that will go in your toolkit, just post it down in the comment section and give us some ideas. If you can't think of anything, then ask in the comment section and somebody will reply. I got some resources for you that I want to share with you. So again, my, my website is about 90% back up and running. So feel free to go over there, onehappywidow.com and just click around and see. I've got some blog posts that I'm posting up. Slowly that's going to grow. Um, I do have the journal template back up. So if you want to go to onehappywidow.com slash journal, you can go there, click on it, and you can download a free set of journal templates or just blanks, but they're, you know, they're set up so that you can print them out and have some journal pages for yourself if you want to do that. Um, I have some other resources that I'm working on and creating. If you're at that point where you're ready to, like your past fresh grief, but you're really not sure how to pivot into that new life of hope and acceptance and where you're trying to make a happy life for yourself and you're not really sure, then my pivot course is still available. So you can go to griefpivotcourse.com and it'll take you there. That's a, um, a course that you can just purchase and have lifetime access to go through it at your own pace, get it and then go through it and then come back to it if you need it. Cause it's something you can do over and over again. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking about going through it myself. (laughs) I created it and I'm fixing to go do it because I know that it's helpful. And I can't even remember all the things that are in it because, you know, it's it's been a while since I've done it. So, Um, and the Facebook group, Um, our Facebook group has had like a little uplift recently. We have lots of new members. We have a new moderator. Um, And so we... Um, our moderator has so graciously offered to come in and help me with approvals. And so now approvals are taking days rather than weeks. If you go in and you um, apply to become a member of the group, she's also very active with like prompting people with questions and getting the conversation started and welcoming new members and things. So she's able to do some things that I haven't even had the time to go in and do and just kind of revive the group a little bit and keep things going. Still, as always, it's a very positive supportive group of people that I love and um, I wish I could be there more often for us just I've got so many other things and my job coming back up so I'm in my new office I still have my same backdrop but I was next door to in the room over there but I have just this room that's set up just for me I've got my little window over here and so if you want to see the tour I'm getting ready to upload the um, updates of the basement tour so I did a video in my cereal crafting um channel showing the chaos and ridiculousness of it all and a little bit about me um you know rearranging and stuff but I've got all this footage I've been doing a lot I just haven't been uploading the footage of it so we have made a lot of progress down here and so we're probably about 90 percent of the way done with um, reorganizing the basement and my goal is to have it done before I go back to work in 19 days and I'm almost done with my bible reading um So I've done another channel where I just read a passage of the Bible every day for 365 days. And I did not, I I missed some days because I was supposed to be from January 1st to December 31st of last year. (laughs) And um, here it is June 5th and I'm still not done, but I only have eight more to go. So I'm still doing that. Um, So I'm almost done with reading the Bible, which is on my bucket list. It's just, I knew that if I read it to myself, I wouldn't do it. And so I decided to just read it out loud. Um, and so I went ahead and recorded it and just put it on YouTube so that, um, I would hold myself accountable. So I'm almost done reading the Bible and, um, 
you know, a few other resources that I'm, that I'm creating. Um, I've got one that's kind of big that's coming up that I've been working on also behind the scenes. I don't want to tell you about yet, but, um, it's something that's going to move this channel forward. It's going to move our group forward. It's going to move our community forward. And so it's something that a lot of people have been looking forward to and asking about. And so that's in the works and it's going to be coming uh, this fall. And, um, somebody on the group posted something about a retreat that, that we need a retreat. <laughs> and so I'm like, mm, put it on your list. <laughs> and so, um, I would really, really love to work on something like that, maybe for next summer. Um, I mean, we have a big farm here. We have lots of acreage. We don't have a lot of rooms for people to sleep, but <laughs> we have a good place to, that we could have meetings and we could have get togethers and we can have s'mores and fire pit and we, we have our animals out there and, you know, lots of places to sit and enjoy nature. And, um, if we could just work out a place for people to come and, um, sleep. So I'm going to be working on that. I'm going to be brainstorming on that because I've already got a few ideas on how I think I might be able to work something out to where it wouldn't be cost prohibited as cost prohibitive for people who are far away. And so, I'll stay tuned with that on my ideas later, but you'll have to watch the update video on my cereal crafting um, channel to see the updates, but it's beautiful. This, this, um, yeah, this place is great and it's clean. That's the best part about it. It's giving me peace just being clean. So anyway, you got lots of resources. We talked about some things today that you might be going through if you've gone through the same kinds of things and you know how this feels to be in those places and, um, you know, just comment and let us know. Get in there and apply for the group. Go check out the website. Just, you know, click around if you feel like you need some resources. And um, I'm still working on more stuff for the website. So just kind of keep checking back in and see how it's grown. Thank you again for joining me. If you just found me, be sure to subscribe and um, stay tuned. Hopefully I will be able to get back to more regular posting, but I'm just not even going to make any promises anymore. I'm going to post when I can and do the best that I can. That's all I can do. So thank you so much for joining me. And we will see you next time. Bye.